Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, I will uh, continue the uh, Russian story on the fascinating Russian experience. So, I will speak about Boris Arvatov and uh, Vladimir Tatlin. Vladimir Tatlin is generally considered to be the father of constructivism, title, however, he never accepted for himself. In his manifesto called The Work Ahead of Us, it was written in 1920, uh, Tatlin wrote, among other things, that the results of his work are models which stimulate us to inventions in our work of creating a new world and which call upon the producers to exercise control over the forms encountered in our new everyday life. Uh, the art theorist and keen supporter of formalist constructivism and art in production, Boris Arvatov, one of the founders of the famous magazine Lev, the Left Front Arts, whose editor was Vladimir Mayakovsky, published in the first issue of the journal in 1923 an essay entitled Materialized Utopia. His inspiration for this essay was an avant-garde architectural proposal by architect and artist Anton Lavinsky for an urban environment, a city with a completely innovative circular plan with buildings elevated with the help of a spring-like technique. It is worth noting that there were many utopian architectural projects in the 1920s. Other architects, for example, like Georgi Krutikov, designed cities in space. Arvatov points out that towns of the future have existed in the past too. Uh, more Fourier, more etc. Yet Lavinsky's project has a quite special new significance. Lavinsky has also created a town of the future. And this was naturally only to be expected, not from Lavinsky, from today's revolutionary artists in general. For Lavinsky, Lavinsky, of course, is one particular case, says Arvatov, stressing what he calls the most important. The artist wants to construct. This was the basic idea of the constructive theory as it was described in different manifestos after January 1922, when the exhibition Constructivists was held at the Poets Cafe in Moscow, in which younger generation artists presented constructions also based on form, texture, and the combination of different materials. This exhibition served as the justification of the constructivist method. But Tatlin had worked exactly on the combination of different materials for his non-objective three-dimensional works, which he called painterly reliefs and counter reliefs to stress that these objects were far from the usual notion of relief and had nothing to do with traditional sculpture already since 1914. What impressed Arvatov in Lavinsky's proposal had already been largely proposed earlier by Vladimir Tatlin in 1919. Three years before the constructivist exhibition, Vladimir Tatlin designed and built a model of a tower dedicated to the Third International. Lenin had set up the Third International at the Comintern office uh, in 1919, and that monument would serve as the headquarters of Comintern in Petrograd. Three levels revolving at different speeds, from the first in the form of a cube, the second of a triangular pyramid, and the third of a cylinder, would host functions of the Comintern Committee. The building known as Tatlin's Tower was given the title Monument to the Third International by Tatlin himself. The art critic Nikolai Punin defended Tatlin's work. He wrote that the basic idea for this monument evolved on the basis of the organic synthesis of the principles governing architecture, sculpture, and painting, thus providing a new pattern of monumental construction, combining the purely creative form with a functional. The building was based on the composition of architectural, sculptural, and pictorial elements with studied rotating forms of metal and glass, 
electrical elevators, heating systems, projection systems, and telephone and radio transmitters. It was designed to be 400 meters high. The tower was never constructed. The huge amount of steel, the complexity of the structure, and the looseness of the soil near the river made the project impossible to implement. Nevertheless, it became legendary straight away, and Tatlin became a hero among avant-garde artists. His fame crossed the border of Russia. His project became a source of inspiration for what the new art can offer to the new society. The project has a new overturn of, of Tatlin. When younger generations started studying the culture of materials, uh, Tatlin rushed to explain that the time for pure synthesis of materials has been exhausted and should give its way to new forms of everyday activity. This is exactly what Arvatov points out, that only the alliance of the artist and the engineer eliminate the traditional notions of urban aesthetics. The project strikes, strikes both the artist and the engineer. Arvatov writes, to the former it says plainly, hands off the business of life, you who have remained on Parnassus. The latter, it summons to revolutionary boldness and to a break with traditional aestheticizing towards the organization of life in all its extent. While artists were still discussing the artistic value of the construction, Tatlin went further on to speak about the next stage of constructivism. He chose the most excessive and at the same time transcendent way to convey, convey the message, the design of a building that looks as if it is emerging from a science fiction Arvatov was not the first to envision the active role of art in the shaping of a new utopian society. Vasily Kandinsky encouraged synthesis and dialogue between the arts, and he argued that it would not be long before a new structure will be built, the fruit of common thought and of all kinds of art, adapted to all kinds of art, both existing and those we dream of. Kandinsky called this ideal edifice Great Utopia. He published his theory on Great Utopia in 1920 and argued that our knowledge of what is considered art is very limited today. Kandinsky did not lead the definition of Great Utopia through constructivist theory, but by following his own internal path of thought. He was initially influenced by symbolism and philosophy in the formulation of the theory of uh, Gesamt Kunstwerk, the ultimate work of art, a theory which he later developed in his 1920 manifesto text entitled The Great Utopia. Kandinsky was the first director of the Institute of Artistic Culture, the INHUC, where the theoretic foundations for the constructivist movement were born and developed. Boris Sarvov was involved with the Institute when it was founded in 1920. Obviously, the concept of feasible utopia was the focus of many discussions. Arvatov was a supporter of the idea that constructivism should aim to lead art into production, a production that would break away from the bourgeois stereotype of the beautiful and of high art and radically change the aesthetics of everyday life and ultimately of society as a whole. He writes, brought up on the canons of bourgeois art, the engineer is almost always just as much of a fetishist as his blood brother, the architect. So engineering falls into the sweet embrace of aestheticism and thereby voluntarily condemns itself either to a narrowing of the problems or to social conservation, conservatism. Uh, Tartan himself had worked intensively during the 1980s in the productivity section, designing clothes, furniture, multipurpose utensils, etc. 
Nevertheless, he described as inadequate the constructivist project regarding the possibilities developed by constructivist artists. Work in the field of furniture, he writes, and other articles of use is only the beginning. The emergence of new cultural institutions, vital in our daily lives, daily lives, institutions in which the working masses are to live, think, develop their aptitudes, uh, demands from the artist not only a feeling for the superficially decorative, but above all for things which fit the new existence and its dialectic. Arvatov writes, artists should replace the word content by the word purpose, and it will be clearly understood what it's all about. In 1929, Tatin started working on the idea of his last big project, the Letatin flying machine, with the conviction that he would create a mechanical emulation of a bird skeleton that would need to be animated by human beings. His interest in flying techniques had started earlier in the mid-1920s. His accurate studies of anatomy of birds and insects, the organic forms, the scientific research and his consultations with engineers and physicians, a surgeon and an expert in anatomy, prove that Tatlin didn't want to invent something from scratch, but instead make a replica that would unexpectedly prove to be useful to mankind. His inspiration went beyond the futurist figure of the aviator as the poet of the future, and he was conducted by the effort to invent the science fiction image of the flying proletarian or the actual man of the future, as depicted in Konstantin Yuan's painting. At the same time, he sought to materialize the utopian and yet archetypical image of Icarus. Tatlin believed that the aeroplane was not the perfected version of human flying. He wrote, I want to give back to men the sensation of flight. We have been roped off this uh, by the aeroplane's mechanical flight. We cannot feel our bodies, the motion in the air. And so I have selected the flying machine as an object uh, for artistic composition since it is the most significant, complicated, dynamic form that can become uh, an everyday object for the Soviet masses as an ordinary item of use. Uh, Tatlin made his own conclusions about aesthetics and about the distinction between an artistic and a non-artistic object. My apparatus is built on the principle of utilizing living organic form. The observation of these forms led me to the conclusion that the most aesthetic form, uh, forms are the most economic. Two simple questions appear today, 90 years after Tatlin became seriously involved with the making of Le Tatlin. Why did Tatlin, in the time of a large-scale collectivization, decide to propose an outright individual project? Did Tatlin Tatlin really believed that Tatlin would fly. In a time when science was enough advanced in the Soviet Union, how did he or his consultants not see the deficits of the apparatus? Tatlin apparently believed that his Tatlin could be able to fly, but at the same time he started. He stated that his flying machines should be treated as principle in principle uh, as a work of art. He claimed art in this respect is work with the shaping of the material. But finally, this question, especially today, proves not to be important at all, otherwise we wouldn't value the significance of an unsuccessful and useless construction, and we wouldn't seek the importance of a reproduction of Le Tatlin apparatus, since none of the original three Le Tatlin objects made by Tatlin and exhibited in the Pushkin Museum of, Museum of Fine Arts in 1932 have fully survived. As Arvuf points out, pioneers always hold in their hands just a banner, 
and often a torn one at that. Surely they do not cease to be pioneers for that. Tatlin's project was abandoned in 1932, the same year that independent artistic organizations were abolished as a prelude to the introduction of socialist realism, which in 1934 was enshrined as the only approved aesthetic method for the arts. This gives uh, Le Tatlin and its pursuit of the freedom of flight a significant, a symbolic importance as the last major design of the avant-garde period. We always refer to Tatlin as the artist who conceived two utopian constructions that were never actually materialized. The monument to the Third International and the Le Tatlin. The universal human values are deeply rooted in the process of both unfinished projects. Both are intended to unite people. The first tells us about working as a community. The last, apart from its practical use, serves to liberate the human being, offering at the same time a spiritual experience and an ecological awareness in a very early period when aeroplane pollution was not yet a question. In 1919, Tatlin put on paper a number of positions for his article to be published at the first issue of the journal International of the Arts, which was never published. These positions prove the priority he gave to the importance of invention in the artistic context. The unit of initiative is the basis for the power of the whole in the direction of knowledge and invention. They also propose an answer to the question about the collective and the individual. Invention, he writes, always manifests itself as the conclusion of the tendencies and wishes of society as a whole and not of the individual. What one can cons conclusively say is that both the, Tatlin, the uh, Tower and the Le Tatlin, despite having proved defective and thus not materialized as they were initially planned by the author, they ne were never considered as failed projects. I would dare say exactly the opposite. Constructivism indeed contributed to the formulation of a new aesthetics of everyday life. The new forms and new combinations of material changed our homes, our tables, our chairs, our objects and our clothes. Constructivism carved a new trail for architectural and industrial design. More than an artist constructor and an artist producer, Tatlin was an artist inventor. Tatlin, the inventor of two major but failed projects, became one of the most popular artists of his time. His popularity had spread beyond the Russian borders. He himself suffered from depression in the last years of his life. But the impact of his work on both his contemporary artists and the younger ones is enormous. His projects are unfinished, but never aged. Arvatov, who committed suicide in 1940, argues that there are many types of utopia. Utopias that are born passively, utopias that are fascinated by the past, and revolutionary utopias like Fourier's utopia. He writes, taking root in the bosom of the historical process, such a utopia becomes a material force which organizes mankind. And that is when we can say with a capital letter, utopia. For who does not know that without Fourier and others, there would have been no Marx. If a materialized utopia is at present only alternatively similar to uh, uh, relatively similar to a realized utopia, then one conclusion must follow, help to realize the path indicated, or finally develop, continue further, reform, but do not turn aside. May this individual attempt this romantic leap across the abyss to turn into a collective, deliberate collaboration organized on laboratory lines. Utopias are visions of a perfect society. 
they are not idealized visions. They can be designed, planned, tested, failed, retested with one purpose, to be materialized. This is a scientific method. And at the same time, it is a revolutionary process and in, it needs a precise program. Arvatov argued on the, on the scientificity of utopia in another essay from 1923 entitled Utopia or Science, or, or Science, Utopia or Science. And I will end my talk with Arvatov's question, Arvatov's quotation. We must not speak about the art of the revolution without a precise maximum program. The working class will construct its own art on the basis of scientific foresight and consciously plan and organize practical work that is in the same way that it acts in politics and economics. The theory of production art offers the working class here and now the prospect of progressing from utopia to science. Thank you.